Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the State of the League podcast. It's been a good long while. It's been uh, since before the holidays that uh, we've talked to all you you fine people. Uh, it's whoa, me. No, whoa, J- that was almost a different word. <laughs> <laughs> what other word that starts with an F could I possibly have you been trying fucks. to say there? <laughs> you fucking morons. All right. It's Jack, a.k.a. Jokic Joe Star. With me as always, my co-host, the world famous Pablo Escobar. Woo! Happy New Year, everybody. Wow. Wow. Typical Jack, black beanie, typical Pablo, timely headpiece. Maybe this could be the dynamic that this joke goes through moving forward. Except when it's summer, I'm not wearing a fucking beanie. I don't know how people do that. So maybe I'll have to get a black baseball cap just for recording this. Um, and then what do I we wear last... for January? There's not really like a MLK Day headgear, is there? <laughs> I don't know. You could do like a Lincoln Memorial hat. Uh, and to just be like, I have have a dream, guys. Like, constantly just be like, you know, I was dreaming the other day. I'm thinking of, like, you know those Halloween decorations where it makes it look like you're being stabbed in the head? Uh, Like, somehow, like, John Wilkes Booth his hand on one side and, like, a bullet going through the other or something? My alarm went off. (laughs) Perfect. We're off to a phenomenal start. 2024. I mean, the production values through the roof. We're happy to be talking to everybody once again. Uh, Pablo, how you doing lately, man? Um, pretty, pretty solid. I'm having. Listen, I'm having car troubles. My car, my car is not here, so that's why I'm not there. And I don't. When's it going to be fixed? I don't know. They owe me a new engine, but they don't want to pay for the engine. But there's a recall for the engine, so it's, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. Oh, jeez, I've been there. Car trouble <laughs> is no fun, and the engine, if I recall correctly, pretty instrumental to getting you know point a to point b as they say unless you want to fred flintstone that shit the engine is going to need to work so give yeah. my guy his car back mr mechanic please we 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 need a yeah we need car pablo back basement pablo i mean i love him he's great it's just it not the same, the same. It, and i uh what's it called it's a kia and so the the kia boys are out there and so i am i am safe right now there's no kia boys coming to jack me but but I do miss the thrill, you know, that they might yeah. they might drive by and see and say, we're going to take that because for some reason we know how to take all of them. You know about the Kia, <laughs> the Kia boys? Yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, they my, my... Me, not not the Kia boys, but the Kia, they, they sent a free steering wheel lock that I could put on the thing. That's how bad it is. I know my sister, uh, the. The Hyundai boys got to her uh, oh, a couple months Hyundai back. Boys too? Yeah, yeah, it's the same. I don't know if it's the same boys, but they probably run in the same gangs. Uh, they, yeah, I don't know. They took something expensive, and now she has a steering wheel lock as well. So yeah, so I can. I'm not doing that. It is so heavy. <laughs> I'm not gonna <laughs> put it on every time. And plus, what if I lose the key or whatever? Oh my god, I'll just live with. I'll just live with getting stolen from GTA. That is hilarious uh unfortunately my dad is very intimidating when it comes to cars he's very stern he he's we've we've had a lot of car bullshit in our family we've gone through more cars than we have people and so that steering wheel lock goes on that damn wheel i'll tell you what uh but yeah other than that i don't know can't complain about the shit that's been going on in my life it's a wonderful start to the year and speaking TV in the background. I have NBA TV on in my background. It's not getting through, is it? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this could be like a multi-layered thing. You know how they have a <laughs> they have like split screen. It's like split audio where you oh, just hear a lot of stuff happening all at the same time. Or you you know those YouTube videos where it's like listening to Mr. Brightside from the party or from the bathroom at a party and yeah that that type of vibe listening to Malika Andrews from two seven degrees of separation. Sweet, I'll put that I'll put that in the tags of this video. <laughs> All right, speaking of great starts to the year, who has had a greater start to the year, even though it was technically the end of last year, oh, than the true. Detroit? The Detroit Pistons, uh, starting at the bottom of the East, we're looking at the Pistons. I have them 
Oh, also PSA, everybody, we're doing a new thing. We're giving like them a state that they're currently <laughs> in. And to me, the Pistons are in a state of gaslighting because uh, if you if you look at the if you look at the Pistons like four games, I know they just got fucking elbow dropped by Houston yesterday. Yeah. But four games prior to that, if you look at them and you watched all those games, uh, it was like, how the fuck has this team lost twenty eight straight games? Three. <laughs> competitive game against pretty much every level of competition. They gave uh, Utah with nobody on their roster a good run for their money. I know like Lowry, THT, Jordan Clarkson, everybody was out. They gave Utah a good run. They gave Brooklyn a good run as well with Mikhail Bridges and the whole gang healthy. And then they nearly beat the Celtics. They had the Celtics sweating, the Detroit Pistons. And so they finally got one against the bum-ass Toronto Raptors. <laughs> That was, that was good to see. It was nice. How are you feeling about the Pistons? Yeah, it, it really took crazy circumstances. They need the Raptors to, to just make a trade and be in complete flux and just be, <laughs> be like the one team that's like, we don't care about winning tonight. It doesn't matter to us. Um, but they finally got over the hump. I said that they are in a state of dominance. They, um, <laughs> they, got, they got the win. They're back on track. The law of averages, they might win 28 straight, except last night happened. And they really, they really fell back asleep against the Rockets. Uh, Cade was shot three of 16. So I'm at, originally, I was like, okay, the losing streak might be a blessing in disguise. It's got eyes on this Pistons team. Everyone knows who they are. Now that they got through it, they'll feel like they're invincible. They'll feel like they could do anything. But then right away the next game, it's like they they did not look good. So what what if could we break the streak again? Could they do it again? That's that that might be the the question. Could they do it in the same series? Um, Jay Nivey had a good game last night. Nineteen on um, ten shots, something like that. But yeah, they they got their wings up. Um, Pistons. Maybe they're good now. Probably not. <laughs> maybe probably maybe, not. Maybe maybe they'll turn it around. Maybe Cade is actually taking the leap. There's there's um, stats going around. Like I forget how many over the how many past six games or something where it looks really good. It looks like thirty and ten on sixty seven percent true shooting. But oh, um, I got it. I got it right here. I got oh it right yeah. Here. Something, something right. I have 33 points, seven and a half assists, six rebounds, 67 percent true shooting. Uh, I don't think the true shooting was included in the graphic, but it was like that's the first player to put up those numbers over five games without a win prior to the <laughs> Toronto game. Uh, and yeah, he's he's looked phenomenal prior to last night. And I will take uh, I'll take a little bit of credit for that uh, right before the game or like first quarter. The, the Houston Rockets broadcast put out a graphic where it was like Jalen Green versus Cade Cunningham. Here's their points per game. Here's their offensive rating. Hmm, who's better? And so oh. I quoted it. I quoted it, and I was like, uh, Jalen Green would be an Anthony Bennett talks if he was on the Pistons right now. And then, of course, second I do that, Cade just completely shits the bed. So that's <laughs> that's on me. But prior to my oh, powers my intervening, Cade had been phenomenal for a little while. You're gonna have biased Houston on you, and and all the other accounts. They're gonna come hard. They're gonna say, "Look, <laughs> look, you idiot! That, that's what you said." Um, yeah, they're Kate. Kate is good. I still, I still wonder if um, primary um, initiator heliocentric Kate is the answer. I think it probably won't be when the teams come around. Um, and I put. For now, for now, it's a it's a nice little step up. So they're still in the toilet, but their 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 fingertips just got out the out of the water. I know it's really it's truly insane how they say like winning fixes everything. No, win fixes everything for Detroit. I, like, <laughs> like like it's just the collective sigh of relief to just be like, holy fuck, okay, it's over. We didn't let it get to thirty five or whatever, which it easily could have. I mean, I think they played could, the Spurs could it still for the rest of the year. They're on one game losing streak now. Yeah, I don't know. I I really thought they were going to turn. I I saw your law of averages video where we're looking at a twenty eight game winning streak. I thought that was really going to ring true. But unfortunately, the power of the Houston Rockets was too much. They, they apparently they can break the laws of mathematics in the universe. So what else isn't true? Is gravity <laughs> true? 
I don't know. I don't know. Let me uh, let me jump and find that. Whoa! I float out of nice. camera. <laughs> Editor, put that in. It's just me later. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> for the Wizards, I mean, do you have any closing remarks? It's it's it, it rocks that the Pistons got a win, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, the bottom is bottom of the East. Like I don't think they've really revolutionized the way that they play basketball. They just kind of – it was really more of bad luck that it went on for that long in the three-point era. Yeah. It's the fact that they can't they can't get hot from three ever. It's like their ability to shoot themselves into a basketball game against a mid-opponent, it's pretty bad, and that really limits their ability to win. But even that 28 with this roster, I felt like that was a bit of bad luck. Do you have any closing comments on the Pistons? No, all I'll say is I found out last night that there's one team that's a worse shooting team than the Pistons, and they may or may not be a playoff team. We'll see you later. Ooh, if I had to take a shot in the dark, I'm gonna go Raptors, but don't don't react, don't react, don't react. <laughs> I don't want to. We'll find out. Um, all right, coming up next, the Washington Wizards. <laughs> <laughs> I had them in a state of boredom. Uh, how are you going to be a rebuilding team and have one fun young guy in Bilal Koulibaly and he doesn't even start? How is Whoa, the most Denny intriguing? Slander. Thing? He's still young-ish. You're right. You're right. <laughs> I don't know. Denny, Denny's Denny been around for so long that I'm like, okay, this is just a bona fide role player at this point. But I, I have him on my list. Uh, though He was huge in the run over Brooklyn. Uh, they... They are um, actually two and four in their last six games. They also got a win over Portland. And it's interesting. They're six and 26 on the season. They're three and six in their last nine games. Like they've, they've won several games more than you would expect them to recently. And so, yeah, I don't know. Just in terms of like every bad team kind of having something to pay attention to in terms of Wembenyama or scoot henderson plus the simons and shade and sharp combination like a young core the wizards don't have a young core like just starting out kind of amassing those players and so it really feels more like a team of role players spearheaded by two guys who are at best like third fourth options on good teams right now it's just it doesn't make for super fun basketball although coos did have nearly 40 last night i saw that but it's not <laughs> It's not the most entertaining thing in the world a lot. So for the Wizards, I have them in a state of activism. And so I don't know if you heard, but Kyle Kuzma was named the Bob Lanier Community Assist Award winner for the month of November for his commitment mm. to reversing the cycle of generational incarceration. And so... I guess what he did is he went to jail. He gave them a bunch of moms in jail um, clothes. He gave them gifts for their children. And then he renovated two jail cells. And they call it Kuzma's Corner. And so um, he's – shout out to Kyle Kuzma. He's an activist. He's helping out the people in jail. A lot of people are like, the people in jail. I hate those people. But the people in jail are probably in jail for stupid reasons. So that's that's where – the Wizards are basketball wise. There's not a whole lot to talk about, but Kyle Kuzma off the court. This is a good trade on and off the court. That was yeah, Kuzma. Kuzma's good. Hell yeah, I saw that, and I uh, my first thought was just like, do you know, like the same way they could, there's like a trope in movies where it's like guys in prison finally see a woman, and it's like oh my god, like it's like a shock to the system. Imagine like being a woman in prison. And the first, like, I don't know, non-guard male that you see is Kyle Kuzma. <laughs> like, that would put me into a coma. He is the most handsome man on the planet. So, yeah, shout wearing, out to Kyle He's Kuzma. wearing, like, a stop sign, and it's, like, <laughs> me, and, and it has, like, an epilepsy warning on his outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Look away, avert your eyes. Here are your Kuzma glasses. They censor his face. He's just some <laughs> tall guy now. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, shout out to Kyle Kuzma. Um, the Wizards, it's yeah, it's not a fun team. Um, I don't expect them to get any more fun after the deadline. I think most of their competent basketball players, um Trey Jones or Tyus Jones, I, I expect him to get traded. I think they'll move mm -hmm. some pieces that we feel are kind of like quote unquote instrumental to this roster in terms of like I think. Daniel Gafford could be a guy that they mm. could move off of or Corey Kispert. I think they like Avdia, 
which it's just like I really see him being able to contribute to a winning team right now. And so I would like to see him in a situation where like he's not being asked to do so much and like think the things he can do well, the team just lets him excel at those. But if he stays in Washington, it's just clearly going to be like a yeah, I saw compare him to Aaron Gordon in Orlando. I like that comp. I, I thought that was good. Yeah, if if I'm them, I'm going to hold on to him because he's like one of the few bright spots I have. But if I'm anyone else, I'm trying to pry him loose from Washington and get him out of there because he's he's a really good defender. He's huge. He's fast, um, good passer. He can push it in transition. He can be like a transition point guard. And um, he's been shooting. I don't have exactly. Uh, oh, I can look that up. Or no, I won't do that. Um, he's he's been <laughs> decent from three. So so that's that's really all you can ask for. So free free Denny Avdia. Free Denny Avdia from the shackles of Wizards basketball. Fucking <laughs> Wes Unseld Jr. Get him out of here. Okay. Uh, Charlotte. Charlotte Hornets. I have him in a state of purgatory. Baby, uh, mm. 11 game losing streak. And this team, of all the bad teams, this one feels like it might have the least timeline to it, just in the sense that we know the foundation of what the team is trying to do starts and ends with LaMelo Ball. That is the bedrock mm. of like everything that they're building, building towards. We don't even know. <laughs> I got to make sure all the rest of these are off. Oh my God. Carry on. <laughs> All right, that was the last one. <laughs> okay. Um, fuck. Uh, dude, this rocked. Hell yeah. Welcome <laughs> back, everybody. <laughs> um, okay, so like LaMelo Ball, we don't really know if he's going to be like a 60 games a year guy for the rest of his career. Uh, I know he played 70 like last season or two seasons ago, and that was promising, but at the same time, it does feel like – if he became Lonzo ball caliber health, would it floor me? Probably not. And then beyond that, once you get like LaMelo out of the way and you look at the rest of this roster, it feels like there's a split between the Terry Rozier, Gordon Hayward camp of uh, older capable guys who could do things on a, a, a winning team. I like Terry Rozier. I think he's super clutch. I think he's cool. Uh, I liked him in Boston and the fact that uh, they've just stuck his ass down in Charlotte this whole time. It's pretty gnarly. And then you have like very young guys, uh, Brandon Miller, Mark Williams, who if you're not going to like commit to having a bad season, if you're going to try to win every year, it doesn't feel like the most conducive environment to like developing guys like that and getting them to hit their ceiling. So in this, in like, four years three years they're really playing basketball that like can start contributing to a winning season if you're trying to win every year you're probably not giving them the developmental minutes that they need they're not historically bad uh the way that the wizards and specifically the pistons are but the wizards are historically bad as well they're just like if it was a regular season they would be the worst team in the conference the worst team in the league maybe they're just regular bad yeah, they. Um, I'm hoping. I'm hoping they could get to the Pistons level losing streak because that would be fun to watch. But they're they're at 11 games right now, so yeah, they they have a they have a ways to go. Um, they're 0 and 4 in their last four. I said they're in a, in a state of searching for silver linings because there's not a lot going on here. Lamelo's always hurt, like you said. Who knows how close we are to Lamelo saying. Playing in Charlotte sucks. I've been here for a little bit. I want to go somewhere else. I'm LaMelo Ball. Get me to L.A. or something like that. Um, uh, Gore, so, yeah, I said they're in a state of searching for silver linings. And so here are the silver linings I have for this roster because they're a disaster. Um, Gordon Hayward got to go on the Paul George podcast. So that's some national representation. And then they played against Phoenix. Bradley Beal, um, Brandon Miller posted a photo of it on Instagram. Bradley Beal commented, we're doubling you next game. And then KD replied, nah, I got him next game. So that's a little, that a little bit of, little bit of fan fiction to hold them <laughs> over. It's very funny to imagine a, an NBA front office opening Instagram and being like, oh my God, Kevin Durant knows who we are. This is so crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. That, that just happened to me with, um, like Griffin, he he. Uh, I talked about how he's a pioneer and how he's 
I'm more of a pioneer than Obama. And then he he commented, I was like, oh no, I've been perceived by Blake Griffin. <laughs> Hell yeah. Shout out to Blake Griffin, bro. Uh the Pistons need to come back. 2019 Blake Griffin, Pistons Blake Griffin. We love him. We love to see it. Uh stand up <laughs> comedy Blake Griffin. I think he's fine. I've seen a couple clips. He's funny enough. He's basketball. He's like Damian Lillard rapping. You know, it's like holy <laughs> shit, you can fucking dunk over a car and you're this funny. Good job, mm-hmm. Blake Griffin. All right, all right. And then I think it's really funny how uh <laughs> like I was kind of worried about the Hornets moving forward. I was like, damn, are we like gonna have to talk about Miles Bridges at some point? No, they fucking stink. He's been like completely normal. He's been like 20 points per game on a bad team, which in the modern NBA feels like a lot of players could do. He doesn't move me. Uh, and I'm glad I'm, I'm to be honest, Charlotte kind of deserved this. Yeah. If we're, if yeah. we're keeping it being everybody, like I'm not, I'm not like broken up over the fact that you guys haven't been good this season so yeah stay in purgatory um as long as you're employing miles bridges you can stay in purgatory uh, i don't care Get if, if miles bridges is still on there after with the conclusion of the next nba investigation that they they got to move down from purgatory to, to hell because that is <laughs> he, he tried to kill his wife <laughs> that's not I don't, can we have some can we can we have some morals here <laughs> can we, I, I don't know I don't know. Um, yeah. But he didn't, I he mean, didn't we can, you and me. Or whatever. <laughs> yes, it's pretty uh, pretty gnarly shit going down in Charlotte. Uh, <laughs> moving up, moving north. Burr. Ooh, it's getting chilly. Um, we're going to it. Toronto, <laughs> where the Raptors are in a state, a New York state of mine. Whoa. Uh, whoa, yeah. <laughs> The Toronto Raptors, if you haven't heard, if you've been living under a rock, they moved OG Ananobi and Precious Achua in exchange for RJ Barrett, the home country kid, and Emmanuel mm. quickly. Uh, and yeah, they just made their debut. They won last night. I was watching the college football playoffs. I didn't watch this fucking <laughs> game because the, the playoffs, that was a banger game uh, in football, which I usually don't even care about, but it was fun. Uh, I like this trade a lot for the Raptors, specifically – quickly for them i think he's gonna do well in a bigger role and i like the fact that they're just if you lose og or siakam for nothing the way that you lost fred van vliet that is a big blow for what you're going to be able to do at the start of the scotty barnes era in toronto and so the fact that they got not just like something back for him but pretty considerable stuff i think like rj's been putrid offensively for the past several weeks when i checked his splits i was like oh my god like 27 percent from three but there's stuff there to like and then quickly uh he's really good i i think everybody can agree that he is gonna do well there um and so yeah i, I like the move for them how'd you feel about it for toronto yeah i i think it was solid for them too i think this was like as close as you're gonna get to an actual win-win trade a lot of times people say a trade is win-win and um it's just well a lot of times a trade will be really good for one team and then just good for someone else and the team that it's just good for they're like well we won too and everyone's like okay whatever you want to say um Mm. i but i said uh the raptors are in a state of flux they're two for two or two and two in the last four they made the big trade they lost to um detroit humiliating um but yeah i'm when it comes to rj I'm eh on on them acquiring him. I guess with with the way the salary cap is going, his contract is not as damaging as it used to be. Um, but still, it's just a lot of money for like a three and D wing who can't really uh, shoot. Defense goes up and down, and decision making I think is is a problem still, and it it always has been. And so I'm I've never really been a believer in like a star ceiling for him. Um, but I mean, he is he is a dynamic piece, I guess. Uh, and he's the hometown kid, so maybe maybe something will happen. Maybe uh, maybe they could just rebrand him to being like their their just Jordan Clarkson bench filled it up scorer type guy. I don't know something. Um, but Emmanuel quickly is a big time get, and I'm I'm excited to see how that looks. I think he pairs pretty well with Scotty Barnes. Um, I saw these uh, stats l- last year when he played as a starter for the Knicks. Um, 
It, it was with either Jalen Brunson out or one other player out. Uh, in 21 games, he averaged 23, 5, and 5 on 61% true shooting, 40% three-point shooting on eight attempts per game. That's a lot. Uh, 84% free throw shooting on four free throws per game. So he was putting up, like, legit numbers. Um, and so I wrote down next Jalen Brunson, question mark. Could oh, be. Um, okay. Because he he really – and. On top of it all, he's like a really good, he's a pretty good guard defender. Uh, one of the better ones in the league. Um, last year, he was shooting 67% at the rim, which is really good. This year, that fell down to 57%. So um, I don't know what people think about that. Like, because he, he's kind of, he was kind of in Tibbs' doghouse. He was like relegated to the shadow realm. Um, yes. Didn't, didn't get a whole lot of run. And, and I'm assuming the leash was shorter when he was out there. So I think that can affect how you play. Um, but if that number can go back up, um, he's also one of the better mid range shooters in the NBA. He's one of the better pull up three point shooters in the NBA. And um, even though he's not like a true floor general passing point guard, I think that that's really offset by playing with Scotty Barnes, who is a fantastic passer and so i think he could um be be more of like an on plus off ball type guard with them um but yeah he's still pretty young uh i think i think it's a really really good move for a team that the core was pretty much done i saw someone else say this on like twitter or reddit or something they're like they were just a team full of a bunch of different agendas like siakam is trying to um make an all NBA team to get uh supermax or whatever. OG is the three and D guy. And um he's like, I don't want to be a three and D guy. I want to be more of a shot <laughs> creator. And then it's funny uh because now I turn on the jump and they're talking about OG in the uh, with the Knicks and they're just like, yeah, it's so great how he doesn't need to dribble. He it's just so <laughs> cool how he stands in the corner and you just pass to him and he shoots and he defends. That's all he does. That's so cool. <laughs> so I was like, oh my god, he's gonna be so bad. Um, but yeah, Fred Van Vliet when he was there, he's like, I'm. This is my show. Scotty Barnes, he's like, this is gonna be my show. Move over. Um, so they they just have a lot of competing agendas, and so now it's good. It's good to. Free, free OG, and then get get a good piece of return. Yeah, um, I like a. I don't know. You called it a win win trade, and I'm I'm with you on that. It's just funny how like uh someone asked me about it on TikTok, and I was like, it's a win win in the sense that like each team is walking away with something that they needed, and like sets them up well for the future and all that. Nobody got fleeced, blah, blah, blah. If you look at it from a pure talent standpoint, it's like, okay, well, you know, quickly plus RJ probably outclasses OG. Maybe, I don't know. I guess when you throw Precious in there, it's just funny to me how like Tibbs never let quickly close games. And so this yeah. kind that that made it like a no brainer for New York. It's like okay, yeah, maybe this guy's good. Oh yeah, Tib, yeah. From Tib their won't fucking play him. They're... So like, yeah, <laughs> like we can't do anything with them. <laughs> from their perspective, they're like, we got rid of our bench warmer and RJ for OG. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I think uh, probably the next step for Toronto get Siakam out of there i think uh i heard some shit about maybe him to the mavs i think he would be a good fit on the warriors if they could figure out a package for him they have pretty much nothing to offer and <laughs> toronto has been historically a little bit crazy about the value of guys it seems like they cooled off with og when he was like hey i could just fucking leave in the summer and they're like okay well <laughs> maybe five first is a bit much for you pal but yeah um yeah i like what the raptors are doing they got to win i think i also liked their game against the celtics that was a very entertaining one where they entered they were down like 15 at halftime and they were down substantially heading into the fourth quarter as well. And they made it really close. I think the the Celtics still came out on top with like a crazy Derek White step back three that we'll yeah. probably talk about a little <laughs> bit later. But uh, in terms of the guys that they have there, I think Schroeder is good and he will give them like a nice little bit of structure in the locker room. I like the blend of youth and veterans and I don't know. You can find something positive to say about pretty much every roster, but I like the way Toronto is moving now that they're blowing up the core. Everyone has been saying, hey, blow this up for like 
over a year at this point, but it's still good. Yeah. Oh, voice crack. It's like puberty. Um, Scotty, Whoa. Scotty, <laughs> Scotty Barnes. Uh, he's been putting up huge numbers. I didn't write them down. Um, but yeah, this will this team will basically be the Scotty Barnes show going forward, and so. That's I think mm-hmm. that's the best course of action because best case scenario yeah. things start going well you're like Jesus Christ the Scotty Barnes show is great worst case scenario lose games get a better draft slot although bad draft the answer is not coming along next year so yeah we'll see um I have Scotty December here twenty four eleven and seven on sixty four percent for shooting in December wow. uh, several thirty point games seems to play well against big opponents to put my uh to put my like first take pundit hat on with no <laughs> evidence and just based off vibes but yeah he he's really good shocker scotty barnes has rocked so i think moving into his direction is good for everybody moving into it's weird how they're above them in the standings but i like them a lot less the hawks i have them as a state below average, they're usually the poster child for 500 basketball, but they've been on a bit of a skid lately. Uh, they just lost to the Kings, and then, damn, who the hell did they play? They've lost they several lost in to a the row. They lost Bulls. They lost to Memphis. They did get a win versus the Wizards. I think mm-hmm. it might have been last night or whatever, but, yeah, they've, they've been a little rough. Not great. Yeah, um, what, what's your state for Atlanta? I said they're in a bittersweet state because Trey Young is back, baby. 28, 11 assists per game, career high, three rebounds, 59% true shooting. All the numbers look good. He's playing out of this world. If you'd scroll Twitter, you see people posting Trey Young clips. They're like, oh, look, he did the Rondo movie, had this defender jumping out of his shoes. Oh, my God, he faked out the entire defense at once. Um, and so – He's he's playing as like uh, he's playing up to like peak Trey Young expectations. Um, Jalen Johnson finally just came back, and so he's very good for them, and uh, he's looked pretty good. Uh, Trey just throws lobs up to the moon, and he comes crashing down with them. Um, but those oh, and AJ Griffin is coming back. I didn't realize he was away from the team for personal reasons, but apparently he's coming back. So that is another good thing. Um, but, yeah, those those bright spots are overshadowed by the rest of the team does not really play in that well. DeJounte Murray is playing pretty rough. He's been in some trade rumors I'm seeing. Like, well, yeah, and he's like – he's a very interesting player because at this point he's very far removed from defensive – or all, <laughs> yeah. to all defense team level defense – like very bad off the ball defender and like pretty iffy on ball <laughs> defender. And then offensively, it's like, I think, I think he actually is shooting well from three this year, but he's just, he's just not, not a super dynamic scorer or anything like that. Even though he's, he's just kind of like always been considered that way. People are like, well, he's uh, long and athletic. He can get to the rim, but he can't really, he always settles for mid range shots. Um, he's just, he's just, they did a star trade for a guy that wasn't really a star, and he's not he's not playing up to the level that he was back then. So not really working out for them. Um, I saw I saw this that apparently they're just blowing games. So here's here get ready. Here's their net rating by quarter in December. So first quarter in in their games in December in the first quarter they're plus seven point three, pretty good. Right, they're they're getting out to a good start. Second quarter plus seven point five sounds pretty good, right? Yes. Third quarter, third quarter. Are you are you happy because you're plus seven in the first two quarters? Third quarter negative nineteen point seven. Oh Fourth my quarter, god, negative seven. So this is a team that goes into the locker room, I guess, and they're like, let's all drink bleach or something like that, um, because they they're just a disaster. Um, I don't know what the path forward is. Kobe Bufkin is tearing up the G League. Like, he's dropping, like, 38 points a game. That's not true. He did it one game. <laughs> but I think I think he's I think he's had a few big games. So the Hawks fans are like, call, call him Kobe. It's our Kobe. And, and he – his projections are kind of similar to being what DeJounte Murray was supposed to be. So um, 
I don't know. There, if you're a Hawks fan, you're in a weird spot because you're like, we're finally below 500 for the first time, which is really, really bad. But Trey is playing very, very good. Also, Trey is competing on defense this year. I don't know if you've seen. Yeah, like, he's, he's like trying. he's locked he, in. He still can't do anything. <laughs> he kind of, well, he kind of like jump passing lanes sometimes with his speed and like reading the game. But but he is like putting an effort. But it's it's funny. Um, like there's been two things with him. It's always been will he play off the ball. Will he compete on defense? And I've always been like, well, he's just never going to play defense. <laughs> so I, I want I want him to play off the ball. But somehow the defense has come before playing off the ball. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, it's just a rough spot because you have trade, you have promising Jalen Johnson, but the rest and Bogdan Bogdanovich is good. But it's just like the this team, it's got all the same pieces. Um, and they're, they're supposed to be good players, but uh, it's just not working out. So I don't know what you do from here. Like, can you reconstruct this roster um, with Trey Young on it? Because he's, I feel like he's too good to keep you out of, like, full-on taking range. Um, but I don't know what the path forward is here. Yeah, it's it's incredibly difficult. It's one of the most difficult things in sports or in basketball uh, where you're just like, you have that guy who keeps you out of tanking range and he has for a while. So you haven't really gotten like super quality draft picks, but you haven't had a ton of like deep playoff runs to show for it or anything. And so the second the John Tay Murray becomes available, you're like, Oh shit, this guy can defend. He kind of, he does all the stuff that Trey's not good at. And then it, you, you finally get him on your team. You give up all those picks for it. Like you said, a star package. And I mean, with that not working, it makes me pretty shaky on like what the Trey era is going to amount to in Atlanta. Cause I don't know like how you're going to build out this roster, even if they pulled off like a really quality trade to snag somebody who comes available like a Pascal Siakam, which I would hate the fit there or anything, but like, I don't think that raises the ceiling to being like a true, if you look at, Boston, Milwaukee, Denver, Philadelphia, Minnesota, Oklahoma City. Like it would take huge strides for Atlanta to even have like a puncher's chance in a series against teams like that. So yeah, I'm a I'm concerned. And Dejounte Murray, uh, it, I I tuned into one of the Hawks games. <laughs> Maybe it was the Kings game where uh, the announcers were just like, yeah, the Hawks are one of the worst backdoor cut teams in the league. <laughs> and every opponent knows that, like, you will, if you tune into a Hawks game, you will see several backdoor cuts a game. And DeJounte Murray is one of the driving reasons behind that. I mean, his guy takes off, and despite him being a long, fast, athletic guy, he's just not paying attention. And it's like, yeah, it's a layup for the other team. He plays like that. They don't exactly inspire the rest of the roster to play defense, even though Trey has been very active. And I did want to commend him on that. Trey, Trey got active on D before Luca did. Mark it here, 2024. <laughs> it, the, the Hawks won the trade because of that, baby. But yeah, yes. I'm, I'm a bit concerned. Yeah, it's 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 I think that's one of the worst things you could possibly do is strike out on your superstar pairing. Um, with like what they did with DeJounte, like when the Mavericks missed on Porzingis, that they've, they've recovered. They somehow figured out how to get Kyrie, but um, that was a big blow. There's, there's some other teams that I can't think of right now where you, where some you bonus. Just, I mean, like, and some yeah. bonus isn't like a complete strikeout or anything. He's probably going to be an all NBA player this season, but we've talked about it before in terms of like, yeah. can't shoot, can't defend. What does that do for your championship ceiling? Makes it a little shaky. Yeah, you just got to – I I just don't like these moves where – like, like I love Trey. I love Trey as much as anybody, but um, it wasn't like he was guaranteed superstar, like guaranteed this guy um, can be the best player on our championship team. So I don't like locking yourself into a roster where he is that, where you're like, well, we'll just trade for a guy who's clearly the second option to this guy. And that's like what, what the Bulls did with Vucevic, like – um, oh, we have Zach Levine. Let's trade for this guy who's clearly below Zach Levine. And I'm like, well, Zach Levine is not the the guy either. So what are you doing? So I I don't like these moves uh, where they're locked into that. And so will, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they do from here if, if yeah. they'll be able to salvage this somehow. And I mean, even when you talk about like 
a Dallas getting a Kyrie Irving. That, like, I have never seen somebody tank their value to the yeah. point that Kyrie Irving did directly prior to that trade where it's like, oh, yeah, we will happily take like the Dinwiddie Dorian Finney Smith package, get this guy the fuck <laughs> off our roster. Unless that happens, like it, that's that's an exception. It's not the rule. Atlanta's going to be hard pressed to recoup uh like equitable assets in moving DeJounte Murray. Like I don't think they'll get I don't think they'll look for draft capital, but even if they do, I'm not sure they get what they put into him back. Uh, so, yeah, it's not great in Atlanta. It's not great. And you know where else it's not great? Chicago. Uh, mm. What's your state on Chicago? Um, state of trepidation. Um, so they're 2-2 two and two in the last four games. Uh, things have started to look up recently, not for me, but for the, the win now crowd. The, the, <laughs> t- the Chicago fans with no object permanence, which is all of them. That they just see win win game right in front of them, jangling the keys. They say whoopee yippee. Um, they uh, they're Kobe White is looking good. Uh, he's he's become a really interesting player, um, but he's doing it like this is not like it's not our new star point guard did not emerge to to save us from hell. Um, he just he's showing that he can be a really good complementary energy type score on a on a good team like. Um, he he's playing off the ball still primarily. Um, he's making these really deep spot up threes. I was looking at his shooting distance last night. Like all of his all of his threes come like twenty four feet and beyond. Um, and uh, so that's that's cool and that's uh, useful. And he's really cool. And things things are they're getting back on track. But I say state of trepidation because Zach Levine, he's been out the entire time. And now he finally reported to the G League, to the Windy City Bulls. And so he's going to come back. So we're going to learn, can can Zach Levine coexist with this new mid-team that has confidence for a little short burst? Or are they going to go right back to losing games and people are going to say, oh, my God, Zach Levine, he's a big loser. We hate him. We hate his gut. Stab him. He's a witch. Um uh, so I don't know. I'm I'm not excited. I think either way, either way, I lose. If if they start winning, then I'm like, fantastic. We're winning for absolutely no reason. We're just gonna have an even worse pick. Um, if they start losing, then I have to deal with. Oh my God, Zach Levine has no trade value. Zach Levine's an idiot. Zach Levine uh, would have voted for the Iraq War. So just uh, I lose no matter what. Jesus Christ, it's got pretty <laughs> vocal vocal critics over there in Chicago. He's a witch who would have voted for the Iraq War. And, you know, you, you kids don't understand. If you were there, if you were there on 9-11, if you remember, you would have voted for it too. You people don't get Hell it. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, brother. You know, they just can't get – those those civilians can't get away with it. Uh, just living in the same country as people who – I mean, they I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, I say all that to say something completely separate, which is the fact that uh, they were propelled to one of those wins from a 2020 game from Andre Drummond in the year 2024. Uh, he put up like 24 points, 25 rebounds, and that was like one of the driving forces behind them winning one of the games in their last four. And it's just like that is a pretty clear signal to me that like, what the fuck are we doing this for? Like that's <laughs> not sustainable in any capacity. Um, there is no ceiling here for a competitive seven game playoff series with pretty much anyone ahead of them in either conference and several of the teams below where they're at in the West as well. Just like they're not a good basketball team, even though Kobe White has been impressive, like you said. And so, yeah, the last bullet I had for the Bulls was just like, will the front office decide to make one last run with this group because of the relatively good recent play or will they sell, which to me, it's been clear the whole time, sell fucking everything and just like get to work on the rebuild. It's not going to do any good to stick around for one more run. And it'll just leave everybody really sad when they lose like the play in tournament. And it's like, oh, oh, we don't even get like the series that makes us feel bad. We just get this one game and now we're back to, yeah, the 12th pick or whatever. When is the trade deadline? Is that in Feb? Is that at the All Star Game? Is that in like February? Because you would I'm, think that we would I'm, know this, but I have no idea. 
I am not going to know any peace until that day comes and passes, because then I'll know if, if I'm stuck or if we're beyond. Mm, February 8th. February 8th. February you have 8th, just okay. over one month of torturous one, I've contemplation. One, I've got one month of reports saying DeRozan likes it here. He wants to say, oh, DeRozan wants out. Zach Levine loves it. Oh, my God, he wants out every with everyone on the roster. So, oh, my Which, God. <laughs> again, it's so funny to me because <laughs> – who the fuck cares if they like it here? We're not doing anything. We're bad right now. Just because we're good doesn't mean we're not bad. That's what the Chicago Bulls need to learn. I am in a state of stupidity. Uh, I stand by <laughs> that. I just don't think they're very smart. Um, moving on to the Nets, I have them in a state. It's not. It doesn't make a ton of sense because they're bad, but I said a state of secretly being bad because they just like <laughs> – there's a lot of stuff about them that – are like signals of being a good basketball team, but simultaneously they're just not good. The defining games for the Nets lately have been them, to me, uh, almost blowing it against the Pistons. They just like managed mm-hmm. to shoot themselves in the foot a little bit less in the closing minutes of that game. They missed like four or five straight free throw attempts in the clutch just to <laughs> – uh, just to let Detroit throw it out of bounds on the offensive <laughs> rebound on subsequent possessions, which killed me. I was like, if they had scored on any of those, they would like be in a position to win this game. But instead, it's a seven-point game just because they can't fucking play basketball. And then after that, they also got outplayed by the Wizards down the stretch of the fourth quarter, which is an insane accomplishment if you've tuned yeah. into any like fourth-quarter Wizards basketball games. I don't blame you if you haven't. They're not like an organized, competent team in the clutch. They do a lot of insane, bad basketball (laughs) plays. And for a team with uh, the likes of Mikhail Bridges and Cam Johnson, guys who have existed in winning environments before, and Spencer Dinwiddie, although his basketball IQ is a little bit up in the air, it's just it's surprising. I, I don't I don't expect them to be better. I'm not surprised that they're bad, but like I don't know, it just feels like a team that could be better than currently are. Yeah, I said I said they're in a state of frustration. They yeah, things are not going well. I saw I did see it Ben Simmons on TikTok. Uh he posted himself making a pie, but like one of those little Australian meat pies. I don't know, but they're just a bizarre team. Um I think their entire fan base is very upset with the coach. I think they're over Jacques Vaughn. They're they're not happy with what he's doing. Um they are over Spencer Dinwiddie. I guess Spencer Dinwiddie has a very long leash and like Cam Thomas does not and, and stuff, which <laughs> honestly I get that with Cam Thomas, but on Spencer Dinwiddie is really not like a higher caliber level of player. Um, thank God he didn't get his contract in crypto or whatever. Or wait, did, would that pay off? I don't know. I, Probably. If you got it in Bitcoin, it would. Uh, if you got it in anything <laughs> Are they else, back up? probably. Are they back up? Oh, Bitcoin's up huge. Yeah, I saw. I actually oh. saw a, a Twitter argument specifically about this, where it ended with a guy pulling up the current price of Bitcoin, and it's through the fucking roof. So uh, that the other guy got owned. Uh, so oh, yeah, if he had right. gotten his contract in Bitcoin, he would be chilling. If he didn't do that, I, I he'd be down big. I wager. Did did he also try and crowdfund his contract one time? Did he say like, "Hey, if you guys pay for me to come to your team, or if you guys pay like ten million dollars into this GoFundMe, I'll come to your team or whatever"? So he's a forward-thinking guy, but he's just probably not the right guy to do that. Like like if Kevin Durant did that, then he'd be, he'd probably make a lot. Um, but yeah, they're they're just a team full. It's a team full of a supporting cast that doesn't have a star. And I think all of them are like, oh man, are we going to get the star this year? Probably not. We have some chances next year, the year after. But for now, we just gotta we just gotta suck it up. So we'll we'll see how things play out for them. But uh, I'm if I'm a Nets fan, I'm frustrated. Yeah, it would not be fun. Um, and maybe they do get that star. I pretty seriously doubt it this year next year i could see it and yeah they have they have good defenders they have like capable supplementary offensive guys cam thomas is a fucking psychopath uh every (laughs) game like like watching him play and watching some of the shots he takes it's like he's so he's capable of making normal passes to open guys and it's just like you could see the devil on his shoulder being like no fuck that guy 
fuck that guy. You, he's not going to make it. You're going to make this tough contested midi. And if 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 John Vaughn lets him go on a little run, you can see him like <laughs> build his confidence where he misses two of those midis, but then one goes down and he's like, oh, fuck, maybe I'm really like that. Okay. I'm okay. Him. That, I'm him. <laughs> him. Yes. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, not huge on him. Cam Thomas, not huge on him. Mel Bridges, I like him, but the construction of this roster where they're currently at, I don't like it. Conversely, the Knicks, where they're currently at with the construction of their roster, a fair bit more promising. They're still, you know, relying on a Julius Randle progression in the playoffs in order to be like a seriously competitive basketball team. And that makes me a little bit nervous, but they are the other side of the OG Ananobi trade, obviously getting OG Ananobi, who made his debut for them against the Minnesota Timberwolves, who they beat, which is a very big accomplishment in today's NBA. Uh, I have the Knicks as a state of defense. What do you have them as? I have them in a state of bliss, and I wrote in parentheses Tibbs because it's Tibbs specifically who's in a state of bliss because as soon as he saw OG come, he's like, yes, I can play him 48 minutes. I'm going – there's there's not going to be moisture left in his body by the time he's done playing here. I'm going to milk this man dry. He's my new Luol Deng. Um, he's going to guard everyone all the time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my voice. He's like, OG, OG, get back. <laughs> um, he, he is the ultimate tips guy. I think it's, it's, it's a good trade for them. Um, because yeah, like you said, they, they weren't playing quickly. They should have been, but they weren't. And then, um, OG RJ to OG is a pretty big upgrade, um, in, on both sides of the ball, I think. So, uh, he had 17 points, six rebounds on um, 12 shots, three of six from three, two steals in his debut. So he was doing all the OG things. He, Apparently, he didn't even practice with them or do anything. He he was just like, all right, I'll just go out there and play. I don't know what I'm doing. But and he he said, um, uh, all I I'll I'll just cut when I <laughs> when I see a cut. And so that's what he did. And and he still had a good game. And and um, yeah, like I was talking about earlier, he he very much wants to be a big time player, like a big time self creation type guy. He wants a bigger role. And I don't know if this is the spot where that is going to come because if you look at um, the Jalen Brunson quotes, the Julius Randle quotes, like every like the the NBA today, Malika Andrews and um, all of them, the way they talk about them, they're just like, yeah, this is a very good three and D guy. I love the way he does not dribble. I love how he's a smart IQ player who does not demand the ball. And so I wonder um, if he's going to love being in this situation because uh, Jalen Brunson is the guy here. Jalen Brunson is like. He's 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 like all right. We have a we have a certain amount of dribbles. I'm taking seventy five percent of them. So um, it'll be interesting going forward. I think this for sure makes them a better team, but doesn't really propel them to contention for me still. Because like like we say, if Julius Randle is is there, um, it's just hard to see them competing with like the Celtics or the Bucks or the other better teams. Um, Precious Achua could be a solid role player for them. Malachi Flynn. Um, I think people, the draft community used to, used to be super duper high on him. I thought he was fine. Um, but I think it was more for him being NBA ready rather than him having a uh, sky high ceiling. So, but he could be just a fine rotation guard for them. So I think they got better, but it's still, they're still not there yet. And so I don't know what they're waiting for, like, or, or if they're still waiting for Donovan Mitchell or what, but, uh, the, the puzzle is not complete. Yes, I feel the exact same way. Weirdly similar terminology, actually, because I, <laughs> I have a, literally OG is not a big needle mover, but there is a star guard shaped hole in this puzzle <laughs> uh, written down here. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know, you swap out the personnel, you take the negatives that come along with losing quickly in RJ, and then you put all the guys you got back. You're in a slightly better spot, a similar spot, but uh, I don't know. You have guys, I think OG makes Brunson's life easier in the playoffs just as a floor space or a defender. Um, and yeah, the other guys you got, they could plug in well as role players. And I think this makes, uh, if, if, if Randall just doesn't like get completely bummed out if, and when he plays poorly offensively and remains like locked in and engaged as a defender, 
Their postseason, like, they could be fine in the postseason. They're not going to win the championship, but they could give anybody a kind of competitive series. Um, but if if he really lets his body language get down when he plays poorly and the shots aren't falling, yeah, the Knicks are not going to do super well. I like OG for them. Um, it was funny. He played like 20 minutes in the first half of his debut, and I tweeted out, I was like, damn. This shit's not going to be easy for him. And I got a bunch of responses being like, oh, he's used to this. He's playing like the Nick Nurse school of of playing. And I'm like, mm. yeah, okay. Nick Nurse Nick Nurse can <laughs> maybe go toe-to-toe with like Doc Rivers in terms of playing his starters a lot. This is Tom fucking Thibodeau we're talking about. This man, I mean, he will wring all of the, the hustle juice out of your bones and leave you at half court of Madison Square Garden being like, come on, bro. It's it's the third overtime. I know you haven't sat in 45 minutes, but we just need you to close out this game. So yeah, I think he I think he's found a player that really suits his play style well. Um, and good for them. I, I'm glad. I don't think OG is going to become that shot creator. I saw him try to go off the dribble against Carl Anthony Towns. I think it was, and he hit like a little between the legs dribble that was super shaky against a guy who is not like a good perimeter defender and doesn't have quick hands. So I wouldn't really encourage him. I don't know. Happy with what you got, OG. You know, you got a lot of money. You got a lot of corner threes. You're going to get cool cuts, dunks, fast breaks, things like that. You're just not going to get to Hezzy tween splash in the garden. I'm (laughs) sorry about it. Yeah, that's I I think Tibbs probably I would assume Tibbs has the toughest practice practices out of all those guys. Like they're probably just running suicides for twelve hours straight. So this I I think Tibbs has gotta be the hardest coach out there. Yes. And I, I like how he will not go bald. Three strands of hair on his head. <laughs> He's riding it to fucking death, baby. Hell he, yeah. What what does he think about his hair? Like, is he like, this is sick? Or, <laughs> or, like, why doesn't he shave it? Or does he just literally never think about it? I don't know. He's, <laughs> he's interesting to me. The idea of Tom Thibodeau looking in the mirror and going, this is sick. <laughs> that, I like that a lot. Um, all right. Moving to Cleveland from the ritzy, glitzy streets of New York to the downtrodden streets of Cleveland where oh. everybody injured and the skies are gray and there's a big – Big painted over LeBron banner on the side of your fucking building. I have them in a state of surprise uh, because they are weirdly, they were weirdly competent missing Mobley, Garland, and Mitchell for stretches. Uh, and then Mitchell came back and they've been like, Bleh. Um, they blew a 15 point lead to Milwaukee. And then they also lost their game last night with the, oh, they lost in the RJ and a quickly debut in Toronto. And it just has not been super. Good. Jared Allen has been phenomenal in Mo's absence. He's like 20 points, 12 rebounds, four assists, 70% true shooting. Uh, and this feels like a testament to the fact that Ben Mo not really that good at maximizing what the other does super well from an offensive standpoint. Uh, but yeah, that's that's my initial thoughts on Cleveland. What do you think about them? Yeah, I said they're in a state of funk. They're they're not funky state because um yeah just injuries to all the key players the mitchell future is looming i i've i've seen some Cavs fans taking a victory lap where they're like haha the knicks blew their load on og they can't come get donovan mitchell anymore i don't know guys they have a lot of picks i think um so i don't know they're just they're just in a tough spot because things are not going as well as last year the vibes are not as well as last year um, all the injuries that everything everything just feels funky to me i i would be i would not feel good if i was a cleveland fan but i'll tell you what here's the one silver lining they have craig porter jr um the basketball index tweeted out he's the number one rookie in finishing talent so that's what they got going on Oh, shit. All right. Number one, I, I, Craig Porter Jr., he did well, well, lit the Nuggets the fuck up earlier this year. He had like 31 points against Denver, and that rocked. That was so fun to watch my team lose that way. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, he's been solid. Um, I was surprised. I don't watch like a ton of Cleveland basketball, and so I was surprised that he is 
fairly inefficient, but his playmaking is pretty solid. And uh, yeah, it's it's nice to have, I don't know, a good, healthy young guy who's playing the whole time. And he seems to pair pretty well with Jarrett Allen. Um, the In terms of like the funk and vibes that you talked about, it sucks that Cleveland last year, they didn't even get to enjoy being the vibes team. Uh, cause it was Sacramento. So they were just like mm. the they were like the backup vibes team. Oh, look over at Cleveland. They're having lots of fun too. Like they're exciting. The Donovan Mitchell trade. Look at how poorly the Gobert trade worked out. Donovan Mitchell trade worked out fucking great. And now it's completely flip flopped. It's just yeah, that looms really heavily. And I don't think New York's blown their load at all. Like you guys seriously underestimate how scary it can get when a guy. <laughs> that you gave up a star package to. It was like, hey, I, I'm going to leave. So you better get what you can get for me from New York because otherwise you're getting nothing. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll take the picks for Donovan Mitchell if that's what it comes down to. I promise you that. Max Struess, disappointing. I thought he was going to be better. He's like 28% from three lately, 13 Ooh. points and four assists on 45% true shooting over his last 11 Ooh. games. They're six and five. In or wait, five and six. They're one below 500 in that span. And yeah, the questions loom. Does Donovan w- want out? Um, is the Allen Mobley pairing good for anyone? It doesn't help Allen hit his ceiling. It doesn't help Mobley really progress. If he's not going to get like a jump shot in any form, he's not going to be able to play the four super effectively. And so if you could move him to the five full time, maybe bulk him up a little bit, that could help. Or switch him around. Jared Allen, he hit a couple mid-ranges when I was watching. That was fun. So, yeah, I don't know. Shit's just gnarly in Cleveland. I would be very worried if I was a Cleveland fan. Yes, sir. All right. Oh, you know where it's not gnarly? You know where it fucking rocks? Indianapolis. It's Mm. so fun there. It's so fun. I have them. uh, The Pacers. I have them in a state of regaining momentum. Uh, they are 4-0 in their last four games, which is gargantuan. Cannot overstate it because before that, they had lost six of their previous seven. Uh, they're 4-0 over the Bulls, Knicks, Rockets, and Bucks. Their game over the Bucks last night felt like a very big psychological victory considering how hard Milwaukee has really come at them when they play since the in-season tournament loss. It felt like the Bucks took that pretty personally, and then uh, the next game up, Giannis gives them 64 points, the whole game ball situation. And so for them to for them to close Milwaukee out last night, it felt like a big deal. It felt like a win they really wanted to get and were very happy about. Tyrese Halliburton had fucking cooking. I'll let these specific stats simmer for a bit. What are your What's your state on, on uh, Indianapolis, Indiana? I said they're in a supersonic state. Things are going – going good. Halliburton had the back-to-back 2020 games, um, like no turnover. Well, one of them, he literally had zero turnovers. Um, But in these other games, like, yeah, the the individual stat lines from all these games are crazy. Um, He's still having a hyper-efficient year. Um, Ben Taylor from Thinking Basketball, he did a video on him, but it's on the NBA YouTube channel. Go watch it. It's very good. There's some very interesting stuff in there. he talks a lot about Halliburton's jump passes, which um, if you read Caitlin Cooper, the, the one of the greatest sports writers ever, she was talking about this last year. So people know her. No. Um, <laughs> Catch but, up. Uh, Jeez. He, but yeah, he's, he is officially like the goat jump passer in, in all of basketball. Um, and uh, it was really interesting. Ben Taylor was talking about his low turnovers. And so he hand tracked 500 uh, passes of Halliburton's in December. Um, he found on jump passes, fi- he has a 5% turnover rate on jump passes. So 5% of those end in a turnover. On uh, normal passes, it's a turnover rate of 5%. So it's basically the same thing. Uh, so there's no real um, like risk that comes there. Uh, I think he called it like a, 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 some kind of tax, like a jump pass tax. There's no tax there. Um, but he still reaps the benefits of um, like – seeing over the tops of the defense and being able to change angles of passes and stuff like that. So it's, it's only, it's only a positive for him to do these jump passes. And then another thing he talked about was, um, so we all talk about how low of a turnover player Tyrese Halliburton is and like how efficient he is. Um, 
But it turns out that the uh, turnovers that he gets, uh, they still they still come from his passes. And so uh, according to play by play stats, PBP stats.com, more of Halliburton's turnovers come from his passes than any high volume score or playmaker in the league. So he's actually more of like a risky passer than a lot of the guys we think. Um, the difference comes in his uh, ball security as a ball handler. That's where the turnovers are not coming from. Like mm -hmm. um, when we see the turnover numbers with like Luca and Trey and all these guys, a lot of them uh, will come because they are like attacking off the dribble and stuff. They can have the ball poked loose and stuff. Um, but uh, Tyrese Halliburton, he doesn't lose it off the dribble. He doesn't travel. He doesn't commit offensive fouls. And he's just pretty conservative when it comes to uh, driving with the ball and, like, attacking advantages. Um, more often than not, he'll, like, kill his dribble and make a pass and then relocate off the ball. Um, so, so I thought that was super interesting because that's an angle I never really think of. You just look at the number and you assume that he he's um, – a safer or just just better at getting the passes through than everyone else, but that's not that turns out it's not the case. So um, Tyrese Halliburton, not the best passer in the league, which which uh, I think we knew Jokic was better, but still uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's a few there's a few guys that would take over him. But is Tyrese Halliburton the best ball handler in the league? If you're grading it by ball security, he's up there. Yeah. Damn, that's I don't know. Sometimes you just read some shit where you're like, oh, people like examine basketball in layers that like I haven't <laughs> even began to approach yet. And a lot of that that really made me feel that way because it explains so much. Like when you watch Halliburton play, uh the risk factor of his passing is that of a guy who averages three or four turnovers a game when you watch like how he leverages uh the way the defenses react and like the shit he does with the basketball jump passes specifically are something that like routinely every other player when you see him jump up in the air and look for a pass you're like oh shit this yeah. is a disaster waiting to happen <laughs> like this is not a good play fundamentally or even from like a fun street ball perspective. Like this is just shit that doesn't work out, but Halliburton is really good with it. And so for him to, yeah, be that secure with the basketball, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's good. Yeah. Like it uh definitely helps what he does offensively because yeah, fuck, that's crazy. I don't know. People are so much smarter than me. <laughs> um, and that, that's my big takeaway from that. Uh, and yeah, I, I think I was watching the end of the Bucks game and he had a play where like he turned it over in transition he tried to do something a little bit fancy he thought buddy healed was trailing and he just like threw it directly back to the bucks and it was so jarring you don't like it it doesn't overwhelm you when he makes or uh, like a when other players make a turnover you're like okay yeah that's to be expected when luca turns the ball over i'm like okay high usage get passes a shit happens you know but when Halberton does it it's like oh shit when is the last time I even like saw him do that in a memorable way and so I think that's just a testament to how good and how smart and effective he is offensively also down the stretch as a scorer uh in this previous Bucks game it was reminiscent of the in-season tournament game a little bit where they I mean Milwaukee I'm gonna we're, we'll get to them in a little bit and their perimeter defense was just atrocious <laughs> in this game and they really seeded the mid-range jumper and the floater area to Halliburton and he thrived in it completely down the stretch he hit several big mid-range jumpers and he's so good at uh using the re the reactions of the rim protector on the defense to kind of like he he gets them paranoid about the dump off pass they're freaking out they're freaking mm -hmm. out and before they commit blocking that shot he is able to float the ball up over them on his floaters. And it resulted in a couple of and once that really shifted the momentum of the game in, in favor of Indiana last night. And so I just wanted, I mean, in a game that had Giannis and had Damian Lillard and all these good players, Halliburton was the best coach player on the floor. It was sick. Oh. And also, uh, <laughs> Indiana's bench, uh, Indiana's bench, 70 points. How many do you think Milwaukee's had? Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm going to guess 42. 
16, 70 points to 16 points. <laughs> Dude, it was fucking ridiculous when I checked the box score. I mean, McConnell, Matherin, they, they, Indiana's a deep team, and Milwaukee was running an eight-man rotation, but still, it was just like a complete slaughter whenever Milwaukee's starters were not in. It was not good. So, yeah, shout out to Indiana, getting it back on track. Very fun, fun to watch. That losing six in seven games, it was like, I don't even know who you are anymore. Where did, where did, you're the vibes team this year. Where to go? But it's back now, and I, I like it. Yep, that's, that's all I got on them. All right. Um, Moving on, Miami. I'm going to keep it a buck. I don't really watch that much Miami basketball. I have them in a state of overachieving just because I'm like, whoa, why the fuck are they like the five seed right now? Aren't, isn't that a little bit too high? You're going to make it too easy for yourselves in the, in the playoffs. Uh, but I did want to give a shout out to Tyler Hero since returning from injury. He's been 26, 6, and 4 on 60% true shooting, mm-hmm. including 25 points versus Minnesota and nearly – a 30 point triple double. He was like 28, 8, and 7 versus Orlando. Miami is 4 and 2 since his return. I feel like he's become a little bit underrated between his injury this year, all the trade talks he's been in that have been passed up on, and then how successful Miami was last season with his injury in the playoffs. Yeah, I I have so yeah, they're two and two in their last four. I have Miami in a state of spite, and I'll tell you why. It's because I I was going through all the different team subreddits, and I sort by top posts of the week. And so when you look at the top, the other top teams in the East, like the Bucks, the Celtics, the Sixers, they're all just like celebrating their own guys. They're like, yeah, we're awesome. Yeah, we're great. If you go to the Miami Heat subreddit, all like. Almost all of the posts, there's some that are not, but almost all the posts are them just victory lapping the Damian Lillard trade and like other <laughs> takes that other stuff. Like the top, the top uh, post is the Dame package and it's like Tyler Hero, Jovich and Hawkins. And they're like, yeah, you guys thought we wanted to trade for Dame. We, Dame sucks. We hate that guy. Uh, there's like so many tweets of them talking about the Dame trade. One guy came in. And uh, he's like, guys, you got to stop talking about the Dame trade. It's over. And um, the <laughs> the top comment was like, no, we're not going to take our foot off the gas just because they suck dick or something. He was so angry. Oh, my God. But they are all so mad. They were like, um, someone brought up a tweet of uh, like from – from back back months ago, that the Trailblazers just like could be interested in acquiring Grady Dick in a trade, and they're like, "Oh yeah, Grady Dick sucks now." Look, they liked Grady Dick, and he sucks, and we have Hawkes, and he doesn't suck. Um, they 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 were taking a victory that uh, there was like a tweet. How did the Lakers not take Hawkes when they have him in his own backyard? And Jalen Hood Shafino sucks. <laughs> there was one. There was one that was just a picture of uh, Jaron Jackson, and they said, "How did this bum win deep way over Bam?" I'm watching him get cooked by Harden right now. And so they are just—they are the angriest fan base. Um, they don't have to be. They're—they're they're up there. They're winning. Things are going well. Um, but yeah, they're celebrating. Uh, yeah, uh, Nikola Jovic. He's he's finally getting some run. Um, he started versus the Jazz, but he only played ten minutes. Um, he had a good game against the Warriors, where he had, had like eleven points and a steal or something. Um, yeah, I wrote down Hero's been doing better. Uh, the Udonis has on podcast. They said that James Johnson beat somebody up. Do we? Who do we think he beat up? Most people are saying. It was probably Whiteside, but it could have been Dion Waiters. Um, have you have you seen that that conversation? <laughs> no, I haven't seen the uh, James Johnson ass whooping conspiracies just yet. Uh, that's pretty interesting. I'd have to take a look at the entire roster back then. I like the idea of him beating up Dion Waiters. That is very funny. Yeah, per- apparently. So this is Bam who said uh, that like. Someone, someone like called him a bitch or something, and they said you won't do anything. And and then and then uh, he like he like just had them like begging for mercy. <laughs> so uh, the, a lot of people are saying white side, but well, we'll never know. Maybe uh, that does kind of sound like Hassan Whiteside to be like you're a bitch. 
I'm yeah. seven feet tall, which if I was seven feet tall, I would not know how the fuck to act. I'm really glad that I'm not. Um, <laughs> and then just like get his ass beat by a guy who knows how to do like leverage on his long ass limbs and just be like, oh, <laughs> torque. Oh, fuck. Ouch. All right. Yeah, that's that's all I have on Miami. I mean, it's hard to talk about them where it's just like, uh, yeah, if Jimmy Butler becomes fucking God in the playoffs again, and it looks like it's going to be Jaime Hawkins this year, if they get their good role players to be good, the sky's the limit with them. Yeah, it's hard to talk about them in January when that's their whole approach to the season. So shout out to Miami. Shout out to James Johnson. You're not a bitch, sir. I'm a bitch. I'm sorry. Please leave me alone. <laughs> all right. How do you feel about the Magic? I feel like I've been taking all the states away. So what, what's your state on the Orlando Magic? I'm in a state of curiosity about the Magic. So I told you earlier that there's one team in the NBA that's a worse shooting team than the Pistons. Ooh. And it is the Orlando Magic. And so they're 29th in threes. They are 24th in free throw percentage. Paolo shoots 69% from the free throw line. Franz shoots 27% from the three-point line. Um, Only the Pistons are worse from three. Uh, Paolo is the only player on the roster who makes above one mid-range jumper per game, and he's shooting those at 36%. Oh, my God. This is not a team with any shooting talent at all it's it's going to be a grind and so i but they're still winning they're still up there they're still like tied i think they they have the same record as miami so they they are they're very interesting and i'm so i'm just curious how how are they going to function with the shooting i'm curious who is actually the best player on this roster is it paulo is it franz is it Suggs? um they they've gotten wins against the Wizards and the Knicks. They lost to I think they lost to the Joel Embiid list uh, Sixers. Um, they did. They, yeah, I have yeah, that written down here. Yeah, they lost to the Suns. So they're I don't I don't know what to think about them. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of red flags, but things are still working. Yes, I think. Okay, my mine is the state of painful youth or youthful angst i think maybe yeah let's go with a state of youthful angst um <laughs> two and two in the last four three and six in the last nine losses to the beal booker sun 76ers without Embiid. it just i mean teams that they should be capable of going to toe to toe with um and like i feel like my big response i agree with all of that and one of my big bullet points is just that is okay right now it's okay <laughs> like it's not it's not okay to expect them to be like, oh, we were bad last year. Now we're like real threats to win the East. Like it's fine to just be like, okay, we're, we got a good defensive identity. We got two wings with serious promise and nobody could shoot the basketball, but we're all young. We're all still developing our jumpers. So somebody's going to fucking do it. Uh, and yeah, I think that falls in line with, uh, to me, it feels like they're a team, maybe even more than Indiana, although now that Indiana's been on a bit of a win streak, they'll probably just be like right on the same tier with them, where it's like they're a team that straddles the gap between the best teams in the East and the bad teams really well, where it's like they're capable, more than capable, of beating up on bad or below average uh, Eastern Conference teams, even up to like the Toronto Brooklyn level. Like I'm very confident that the magic are going to beat teams like that. But then if you get them into a game with the playoff opponents that they will probably see if they make the second round, it really doesn't feel like they have the firepower to go toe to toe with those teams, even with how good they are defensively, unless one of their players is just fucking nuclear on offense which does happen fairly often you get the games where Franz is hitting his jumpers you get the games where Paolo's like oh I'm like Julius Randle sized I can just go get a fucking layup whenever I want um but on, uh, if you're not getting performance like that out of one of your stars or even one of your supplemental guards uh the the offensive output of this team really does feel like a team that can't shoot three pointers it's not great uh they had a game against I believe it was Milwaukee I'm not sure on that, but it was, whoever it was, just like clearly their defensive game plan was, hey, we're going to keep them out of the paint today. And whatever looks they get, they're not coming in the paint. And it made Orlando extremely uncomfortable, and they got blown out in that game. It was not fun to watch. I'm high on them, but uh, 
any if they get into a playoff series with anybody above them in the standings, or even if the Heat end up below them in the standings, I, I like Heat, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, Boston, all those all those teams of Orlando right now. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'd say I'm pretty much in the same boat. Yeah, and again, that that's okay. It's just like yeah, you're young and uh, shit. You, you gotta. You got to lose in the playoffs to kind of see what those yeah. weaknesses that need to be addressed are right now. If you're the worst shooting team in the league, the weakness is pretty apparent. And maybe you could do something to patch it up at the trade deadline, but I wouldn't be like panicking to make a move if I'm Orlando or anything. Just kind of keep what we got together and figure it out in the off season. Um, yeah, don't hmm. blow it up for Lori. Don't, don't blow it up for Lori. I would not recommend it for that. Getting into like a... They're getting into an eBay bidding war with Oklahoma City, who just has like infinite money to play with. And then OKC gets it to a spot where they're like, you know, we actually don't want him that bad. And Orlando's like, <laughs> no, our next 30 years down the toilet. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. All right. How are you feeling about one Philadelphia 76ers? So I said they're in a state of waiting because Joel Embiid, well, now he's back, I think. I think he just played. He is. For your um, Chicago Bulls. Yeah, there yeah, you go. Yeah. Um, but they they were just waiting for him to be healthy. So now that he's back, it's Sixers basketball <laughs> as usual. <laughs> That's all I got <laughs> for them. Hell yeah. <laughs> I have him in a. I have him in the state of awe at Tyrese Maxey, which uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you when you look at every box score, I don't know if awe is the perfect word. They're two and two in their last four, and Bead is out for all four games. Maxey had one elite game, one fine game, and then two pretty mid games uh, against Chicago and Miami, where they lost. The solid one came against the Magic. He had like twenty three points on fifty percent from the field. They won that one, and then he did put up. 42 on 60 or 64 percent true shooting in a four point win over the Houston Rockets, who haven't been as good as they were defensively, but are still a very capable defense. I thought that was a very impressive win. It's pretty clear that Maxi is used to playing off the gravity that Embiid generates and using that to like get himself the looks that he's really comfortable with. And when he is the point of attack for the entire defense, shit gets a little bit dicier. Um, probably the most, this is my traditional sports media take uh, I might have ever had. Uh, is the MVP going to take precedent for Joel Embiid over winning a ring? Uh, that's my big first take opener. It does, it feels like Philly really has a chance this season to me if he is healthy and plays well in the postseason. Um, simultaneously, one of the prerequisites for him being healthy is like, you know, he might have to miss some games and there's only 11 more games he can miss until that 65 game uh, mark for like regular season awards becomes an issue. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. And so, yeah, I don't know. He has seemed like a guy who in the past has cared about awards now mm -hmm. that he has an MVP, maybe that's diluted a little bit. And so I just feel like that's a storyline to kind of pay attention to because yeah, if like, if he's at, 67 games played and like the season's kind of winding down and he could rest but i don't know anything's possible then i think uh maybe we'll see him play through maybe something will happen i don't know just something to keep an eye on i i hope he cares less after the debacle last year where he's like going on a pr tour talking about how much he deserves mvp over Jokic and like taking taking sub shots at him and in articles and stuff like that. That was so lame. And then after all that, they still had the typical result in the playoffs. So I don't want – he got the MVP. I hope that he just doesn't care about it anymore. I want him just just – I'm okay with him taking time off, I guess, as long as – and, like, just saying screw the awards as long as we get this Joel Embiid in the playoffs, which we, we sometimes get but not all the time. Um, but yeah, I I'm what did I say? I'm I'm in a state of waiting. So yeah, I'm 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 in a state of waiting. Joel Embiid, I know you're good. Maxi, I know you're good. I know they they put out the graph. I think Kurt Goldsberry or whatever like put out the teams by efficiency. The Sixers are all the way. Oh wait, let's see where am I? 
the, the Sixers are all the way right here and like the closest team is right there. Um, and so they're they're playing really well, but I gotta see it against the play in the playoffs. That's always what it's been. It's what it's gonna be. Yep. That's just how the cookie crumbles. I mean, very similar to uh, Miami in that way, where it's just, I don't know, we're coming up on the Bucks here, and there's questions about the Bucks. It's like, oh, shit, what's like, is this, are we hitting our stride offensively? The entire dynamic of the, che- the, the team has changed in the offseason, whereas with the 76ers, it's like, yep, holy, sh- this is a good team this season. And, yeah, is it going to be good in the postseason? I hope it is. I hope we see it. And to be fair, I mean, if he plays 70 games, he'll probably run away with the award anyway, the way it's looking right now, um, unless, like, the Mavs go uh, – maybe Shea Gilgis-Alexander, uh, but I, I don't know. Anyway. Hey, getting- hey listen, people, people have short memories. Jokic took, what, one month – they had one month last year where they, like, weren't winning, and he's like, I don't really care about this anymore. And people are like, we forget about everything else, <laughs> so we don't like him anymore. He's done. Hey, yeah, as someone who survived – uh, that month, uh, it was like it was like a four game losing streak against like Spurs, Bulls caliber uh, teams uh, in, in between like a really bad month. Oh my god, that was horrible. So yeah, <laughs> you know what? You could just don't even compete anymore. Who cares? Retire. Go live in Serbia. Who gives a fuck? If you do that, I'll be really sad though. All right, Milwaukee. I have them in a state. This is not a one piece reference. This is a car reference. I have them in a state of fourth gear. Where it's oh. like, all right, all right, shit's clicking a little bit. And I guess it could be a one-piece reference, too, if we're in gear four. And we're looking for gear five. Uh, so, like, yeah, we're we're, we're getting there. Uh, in December, Giannis, 33-11-7, 7, 66% true shooting. Dame, 26-7 and 7 on 65% true shooting. Uh, they're the number one offense in the league over that stretch. However, they're two and two in their last four. Uh, they're nine and three in their last twelve. They just lost to Indiana. How we talked about lots of concerns about the point of attack defense, all of that. How are you feeling about Milwaukee? So I have Milwaukee in a state of mourning because uh, their former owner Herb Cole died, and I went down Damn. a Herb Cole rabbit hole. Do you know about Herb Cole? Uh, no, Let, tell me. So he bought the team. In in the 70s or something, he bought the team to keep them in Milwaukee because they were going to move them. And he's like, no, I'll buy them. I'll keep them here. He sold the team to the current owners, the Edens and Lazary, whatever family. He sold them for $550 million. Um, Steve Ballmer at the time, he was like, I want to buy this team for one billion from you and i'm gonna and okay. uh he was like are you gonna keep them in milwaukee and he's like nope i'm gonna move them to seattle and then he's like okay i'm not gonna sell them to you so he turned Holy down fuck. a lot of money to do that and so i i this guy herb cole it's spelled k-o-h-l um He's the Coles guy, you know the the department. Yes, store the Coles? department store. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's he's that guy. Um, he he is a nepotism baby, kind of, but he's I guess he was a good one. Um, he uh, was super duper rich. He was like one of the richest people in Senate or whatever. But he would like almost entirely and the, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, this is what I read in the New York Times, the rag. Um, he uh, <laughs> was. Uh, he would like mostly self-fund his campaigns. His big thing was like, I'm not going to take money from special interests or whatever. I I do not want it. Um, He was super nice. Everyone on both sides of the aisle really liked him. Uh, Like apparently you could, if you went to DC and you were from Wisconsin, you could have breakfast with him. Um, He, he was a big time supporter of public education of abortion rights. He was like, get, let the gays get married. He supported the environment. Um, when Obama was doing Medicare stuff, he's like, expand it, make it bigger. Uh, Damn. He, he voted against the Persian Gulf War, but he voted for Iraq. So, um, Underst- but- as, we, as we've already talked about, understandable, <laughs> you know. But he's he's a big time he's a big time budget guy. So I guess that was his thing. He's he's like, I don't want us to spend money all the time. Um, then, so he was voting to cut military spending and stuff. So Holy that, that could go either way. Cause then you could, um, you can be like the budget guy who's like, 
we don't have the budget, so no one gets health care. Health care, or you can be the budget guy who's like, don't buy bonds. Um, but uh, he had a 73% approval rate from his voters. Um, his campaigns were, yeah, like I said, self finance uh, He won like three re-election campaigns, and then he stepped away and said, the office does not belong to me. It belongs to the people of Wisconsin, and there's something to be said for not staying in office too long. And so he, he stepped out gracefully. And uh, yeah, what a what a good guy! Shout out to Herb Cole. Maybe is he the one good billionaire? <laughs> Holy fuck! Hell yeah! Uh, shout out to Herb Cole. Good Nepo baby. We're getting. I'm. He's serving Maya Hawk, Jack Quaid. Oh god! And, <laughs> and not um. Who's a bad Nepo baby? I know. I mean, like uh, Donald Carlson. Trump. Ju- oh fuck! Are you serious? You know- yeah, you know who uh, you know who his parents are. He's, who he he is the heir. Well, actually, his dad. He's the heir to the Swanson Frozen Foods um, <laughs> fortune. So oh, I don't man. I don't even really know what that is, but it's big. But you know what? His mom was actually like an artist, like an artsy hipster lady, uh-huh. and um, like growing up, she's like. I don't like this kid, and so she she just left one day and ditched him. Based. So that's oh that's his that's his, that's his origin story. So I don't know if he was evil yet, or if that made him evil. That probably made him evil. That probably made him conservative. He's like, my mom was fucking smoking pot and, I, and I going to museums want all day the arts to be funded ever again. <laughs> exactly. So now he's on Fox News. Isn't, Not isn't that weird? Yeah. Oh he's, shit. Now he's on now he's on X being like, isn't yeah. that weird? Isn't he's, he's isn't it weird? Washed. Apparently he did a an interview with Kevin Spacey where Kevin Spacey was in in character in his house of cards character. <laughs> oh, and, my God. Yeah. So he's and yeah. Now he's he's washed. He's washed for sure. <laughs> Damn. The others follow. All right. Uh, that's so shocking. That's so shocking that an audience composed of fucking 70 year old people <laughs> didn't get on Twitter to figure out how to live stream Tucker Carlson. Oh, man, uh, my TV is gone. What <laughs> the... Figure oh. out where he is or just watch the new one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> perfect. I mean, I think that wraps up the segment on the books really well. <laughs> Yeah, shout out to Milwaukee. I don't know. I think the big takeaway I had from watching Milwaukee lately was just how much more unstable the uh, offensive approach to basketball feels like compared to having a having a good defense that could reliably generate stops, like the best defense in the league pretty routinely, and then every trip down the floor on offense just being like, okay, Fucking Giannis is going to try to score. One of the best offensive players on the planet. We're going to try to get him to score. That's our whole approach. Most of the time, we'll throw we'll throw in like a Middleton mid-range, a Brook Lopez three every so often. It felt like a way more stable approach to basketball because you're. it's a lot easier to get stops than it seems like it is for this Milwaukee team to score sometimes. Like they get... They're a very microwavy team, and like I already said, they're the number one offense in the league for the past month. But I don't know; it just doesn't feel as comforting. the the uh, the Drew Lopez or the Drew Holiday screen navigation that was like my comfort security blanket, and I've <laughs> lost it. And now when I watch Milwaukee, I get very scared very easily. Any any final thoughts on them? No, I think. Yeah, I got everything out I wanted to say. Shout yeah, out to all right. <laughs> Rest in peace, Herb Cole. Shout out to public education and slashing the military budget. <laughs> Moving into a town that I feel is full of people who might not agree with those things. Uh, Boston, the Celtics. I have them in a state of spoils. I only have two bullets for this. Uh, Derek White, tween hezzy, step oh. back splash to take the lead in the closing seconds of a Raptors game. That should have been a blowout, but they let them come back. Uh, they're four and zero in their last four games. They're on a six-game win streak, averaging one hundred and thirty-three points per game. Uh, they're really they're good. The Celtics are damn good at basketball. Yeah, I said I said they're in a state of tremors because they had a couple close games to bad teams, um, the Raptors, the Pistons. 
Um, but it's all good. Uh, they still have the 16 and 0 home streak. Do you know what the NBA record is for the all time home streak? Um, damn, I don't know about streak. I know the 16 Spurs were stupid good at home, but uh, I, I don't know like a streak off the top of my head now. So it's 54 is the record, and it's the Warriors. Um, and it it goes in two seasons. It's from the in the 14 15 season and the 15 16 mm. season. So they went 54 games without losing at home. So will the Celtics break that? Probably not, because um, they almost lost to the Pistons. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot of Derek White optimism for them. There's All Star talk. Is he an All Star? I don't know. I have not gone through and thought about it. <laughs> um, uh, Porzingis, one of the best post-up players in the NBA, 74% on his post-ups. Um, out of all the guys who post up at the frequency he does, like he set like 16% of his shots or something like that. Um, there are guys better than him, but they're all like below 10%, and that's like Shea mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So he he is arguably the best post-up player in the league, which is full circle moment because there was a point in Maver in, uh, with Dallas where he was one of the worst post-up players, and uh, then they made him into a spot of shooter, and everyone was mad at Rick Carlisle. They're like, "Why are you taking the post-up out of the game? The post-up is so important." And he's like, "Guys, he's not good at it. The numbers don't tell him." And then, do you know um, Nate Duncan, the from the Dunkadon podcast? The no, NBA I do not. Thing? So he's like he's like kind of uh, mega dweeb <laughs> kind of guy like like um very, shout out Nate fucking very York. very smart very smart basketball guy but very like I'm the smartest guy in the room type guy and he back in that time he went up to Rick Carlisle in a post game press conference and he said like something he's like hey coach they 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 uh they really want you to post him up right or something like he said something like we both know that he's bad at post-ups and rick carlo got visibly mad at him and like chewed him out in the press conference and he's like and then everyone on twitter celebrated they're like yeah suck it dork and so um <laughs> now now porzingis is good at post-ups so what's he saying now no uh shout out nate duncan i think he's probably a nice guy but yeah just just yeah just be 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 a little less pretentious, <laughs> but I haven't listened in years, so maybe he is less pretentious. Maybe he's chilled out. Maybe maybe Rick yeah. really took him down a peg. Yeah, um, <laughs> the Porzingis post up shit that rings true to me. Just in the sense, I think big difference between uh, Dallas and Boston is the w- Boston's probably a lot better at like forcing several switches that get a smaller guy put onto Porzingis because that feels like an automatic bucket in Boston's offense is like when you like they just run some shit and all of a sudden it's like oh I'm six eight I'm six yeah. seven I'm six four sometimes they get a guard on him in the post it's like okay yeah this guy is the size of a fucking building let's just like watch him hit this little jump hook over like I would need a plane to get up there and yeah uh he's he's really good at those possessions they're really good at generating those possessions for him the ball flows very freely um I don't know, like dipshit NBA Twitter has been kind of hard on Tatum this year for just being like pretty good. But in terms of like acclimating to this starting five of very good basketball players who aren't all like ball dominant, but all deserve to touch the ball at points during the game because they're so good. Tatum has been really good about that this season. They all have been. And so I'm looking forward. Hopefully this is the year for them to get back up to the finals. I think they have a good shot. If I had to bet, it would probably be them coming out of the East. There's a lot of shit that could go wrong. They've had games like that one against the Warriors a couple of weeks ago. where like, if they're living and dying by three, the way they have been this season, when that three dies, it's fucking cinematic to watch them lose holy shit (laughs) (laughs) like especially against the warriors it was so funny just because uh draymond was out by that point and they really had no legit protection and so it's like five guys who are all six six or taller (laughs) just like jacking up threes and like offensive rebound kick it out corner three wing three dribble three pull up three and none of them were going down and i i don't know I don't think 
that'll happen in the playoffs. <laughs> Knock on wood. It's not like that's ever happened before. <laughs> but, yeah, maybe this is the year. Maybe they've learned to take a couple layups now and then. Yeah, hopefully hopefully, Tatum, Tatum struggles don't matter if you just get stacked from the role players. If we just have Drew Holiday, we got – Derek White and Porzingis. So we're good. Hell yeah. All right. I think that'll do it. Um, I forgot to fucking say it at the beginning, but we're doing two <laughs> episodes now. So this is the East episode. Um go. I think we'll probably do it on Patreon next week because I haven't set it up yet, but we I'll just do two free episodes this week. Um go check out Pablo's shit at Hot Tunes TV China NBA. Did I get that right? Yes. All right, cool. He's being surveilled by the government. They've bugged his house, but not his computer. And so, yeah, I got to do all this shit for him. Go check <laughs> me out at Jokic Joe Star on TikTok, on Twitter, on it's Instagram. I haven't posted in like eight months, but I mean, I'm still on there. I still, ch- I watch people's stories and stuff. So, yeah, oh. go check me out on all that shit. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Peace.